Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Ford School. Uh, I want to really thank all of you for being here. It's uh, uh, great um, to see so many people come out for this program. I want to thank the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies and Mary Gallagher for making this event possible uh, today with us. Nearly half a century ago, our namesake, Gerald Ford, traveled to Beijing as minority leader for the House, part of a series of meetings in 1972 that catalyzed Sino-American rapprochement during the Cold War. Since then, China has risen dramatically on the world stage, as has the importance of the U.S.-China relationship one that features a great deal of cooperation, but also, as we've seen, many points of tension. U.S.-China relations are now central to many of our most pressing domestic and foreign policy discussions. Whether we consider President Trump's planned meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, or the possible effects of U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminum, whether we focus on global financial markets or on climate change negotiations, U.S.-China relations are crucial. To help us understand the dynamics of this critical relationship, we are delighted to welcome Danny Russell to the Ford School and to the University of Michigan. He is a diplomat in residence and senior fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute and a career member of the Senior Foreign Service at the State Department. He served as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs from 2013 to 2017. After serving for years at the White House as a Special Assistant to the President, and Senior Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council. He was one of the key architects of President Obama's strategic rebalance to the Asia Pacific, including efforts to strengthen alliances, deepen U.S. engagement with multilateral organizations, and expand cooperation with emerging powers in Asia. Before joining the NSC, he served in a number of important diplomatic roles in East Asia, Europe, and at the State Department headquarters in Washington. He has an extraordinary record as a diplomat and deep knowledge of China, U.S.-Chinese relations, and the broader international politics in which they are embedded. We are very privileged to be able to learn from him today and also appreciate the time he is spending with faculty, students, and visiting scholars all day long. He will begin with some prepared remarks and then open it up for Q&A. Please join me in welcoming Danny Russell to the Ford School. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much, Michael, for the introduction. Thanks to Mary Gallagher for getting me out here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, my background, my expertise is in foreign policy. I've been a diplomat now for 33 years in the Foreign Service, but I'd actually like to start with a question about astrophysics. And the question is, what's up with the space-time continuum? I mean, is the universe expanding? Is the universe contracting? Is time accelerating, decelerating? And the reason I ask is that it seems like depending on whether you're standing in Beijing or Washington, D.C., uh, the world, even the universe, looks pretty different. Uh, in Beijing, right now, the National People's Congress is underway. Uh, not only was there a lot of drama in connection with cementing Xi Jinping's uh, leadership status and removing term limits, uh, but at the same time there's also been a very significant uh, set of announcements about changes in, uh, in government structure to government party uh, reform. It should come as no surprise to anybody who's been paying any attention that the net effect of the changes uh, is to strengthen uh, the party's control, at least in the short term. And Mary Gallagher had a great piece uh, a couple weeks ago in the New York Times pointing out some of the longer term pitfalls uh, in this trend line. In Washington, uh, the pace of change is, if anything, even more breathtaking, and the character of the events more shocking. Uh, summit with little Rocket Man. <laughs> Rex Tillerson out, Mike Pompeo in. H.R. <laughs> McMaster maybe out. John Bolton maybe in. <laughs> and you notice I'm not even mentioning Robert Mueller, Stormy Daniels. I'll stay away from all that. <laughs> 
But if you're in Washington, it sure feels like time is speeding up. Uh, and it feels like the universe is kind of closing in on you. You can get whiplash standing still just from the news crawl on TV. But at the same time, America's aperture seems to be tightening, constricting in, in, in a way. There's the banner of America first. There's the withdrawal from the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. There's the walk away from the Paris Climate Accord. There's the turn away from multilateralism. Uh, there's the sentiment expressed again just yesterday that America's allies are really just freeloaders. Uh, that global engagement has been a losing proposition for the country. The focus on hardening our borders, not on sustaining global leadership. We seem to be sending signals that, rightly or wrongly, are construed by many friends and partners overseas as signals of abandonment uh, that reinforce a sense of a diminishing international agenda on the part of the United States. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum is China. Now, we all know that the Chinese horizon is the time horizon. Uh, is historically a long one, and if anything, it's lengthened. It's not just that we may be looking at uh, Xi Jinping third term, Xi Jinping fourth term, <laughs> who knows, but also it's the centenary goals of becoming a modestly prosperous society by 2021, of achieving socialist modernization by 2035, of uh, becoming a great power and realizing the China dream by 2049. Uh, but it's also the vow to make uh, China the definitive leader in artificial intelligence by 2030. That means something. That's a kind of Kennedy man on the moon uh, caliber national commitment. So China's field of vision internationally, it's a global vision is expanding also. National rejuvenation goes hand in hand with greater global stature. Hide and buy has been supplanted by the community of common destiny, uh, by the new security, the new Asia security model, by the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, by the Belt and Road Initiative, by the Strong Army Dream, by Xi Jinping's speech at Davos in 2017. There's no shortage of indicators. And engagement by China in the world post hide and bide seems to be driven by a number of different factors. Some of them are obvious ones, economic, military, geostrategic imperatives. Even demographics as the expatriate Chinese population expands and China gets dragged into issues and areas uh, in defense of its citizens or to protect its investments. There's also the very human because we can dynamic. Uh, and that factor is driven both by China's economic clout but also by the growing military strength of the People's Liberation Army. But the push to elevate China's global stature clearly is also a mechanism to strengthen the Communist Party's hold on power. It's part of the substitution strategy where national pride, increased prosperity, these sorts of things, help compensate Chinese citizens for the lack of civil rights, the lack of political space. Now there's a lot of discussion also about Xi Jinping's uh, not just his motives for pursuing more ambitious global status, but his goals in pursuing them. My own belief, based on my experience, is that China is not out to replace the United States as the superpower provider of global goods. I'm prepared to take the Chinese authorities at their word on that one. 
Because China is not and hasn't been a missionary culture, not a proselytizing culture. It's not Wilsonian. It's not altruistic. There was a China first policy. There was a make China great again policy long before Donald Trump came onto the stage. And look, Xi Jinping may be a devotee of Lenin, but he's no Trotsky. He's not trying to promote global communist or socialist revolution. He's not exporting that ideology. In fact, the China model is conspicuously laissez-faire when it comes to the politics of other countries. But it sure does look like China seeks to discredit and delegitimize the sort of Pax Americana post-war liberal order. Why? My hypothesis and my experience is that probably the main reason for this is to relieve China from pressure to comply with international rules and international norms in areas where it finds it inconvenient. In my engagements, all American diplomats find that China routinely invokes a kind of uh, core interest waiver, uh, that international rules don't apply to China on issues that it proclaims are fundamental core interests to it. And the fact of the matter is that increasingly China's powerful enough to get away with that many cases. In addition, China undoubtedly sees, uh, we know, sees opportunities to occupy abundant space open by U.S. missteps or even U.S. retreat. As I mentioned, Davos, where Xi Jinping claimed the mantle of the champion of the open global trading order, uh, not something you would have uh, expected given China's actual policies. Uh, I mentioned TPP, where the withdrawal really left open the multilateral trade arena and abandoning the Paris Climate Change Agreement, which ironically was a product of a US-China uh, deal. Uh, and relegating the United States once more to the uh, position of majority of one uh, in an international arena. So on the one hand, what has emerged is Washington sees in China a growing swagger, a sense of entitlement, even hubris. They're building a non-Western form of capitalism and a Sinocentric <laughs> form of economic and security, the new Asian security model, whatever the label is. At the same time, Beijing sees the US, which is increasingly and publicly defining China as the threat. As a country that's out to defend a rigged status quo, that the United States is seeking to use international rules and international institutions, which China had no hand in developing, as instruments to contain China, or worse, to weaken China and to divide it. So this is not a great dynamic. There's a a key question in all this, which is if China is in fact going to fill the void left by American retrenchment, what are the tools that China is going to use to motivate other countries, the rest of the world, to go along with it? Will it rely on coercive tools like economic leverage? Or can it build consensus around common interests uh, and universal principles? And if so, what are those interests? What are those principles? Put it this way, is there an export model of the China dream? 
Well, shift gears for a second and, and just do a quick inventory on the U.S.-China relationship, uh, including then and now. So the then, at least for me, was when uh, I was loaned by the State Department to the uh, incoming Obama administration in January of 2009. And the starting point for the Obama administration that I was part of was the value of the Asia-Pacific region to America's economic interests, which were under tremendous stress, uh, as well as to our national security interests. So the theory of the case was to put equal emphasis on strengthening alliances, engaging and supporting regional institutions for rulemaking, promoting soft power uh, and the values agenda, democracy and human rights, not as a sermon, uh, not as a rebuke, not as a lecture, but as a guiding principle of our behavior and our policy. But also engaging with, the, with a span of emerging powers that includes Vietnam and Indonesia, India, but of course, importantly, it includes China. And we were deliberate, though, in developing an Asia-Pacific rebalance strategy with a China component to it, not developing a China strategy with an Asia-Pacific component to that. Secondly, we operated from the conviction that, number one, competition is legitimate and can and should be healthy. That meaningful co that cooperation, if it's meaningful, uh, is worthwhile and can coexist with competition. Third, that we weren't going to ignore the real differences or paper over the significant differences uh, and points of friction between the U.S. and China. We were going to try to deal with them. We weren't going to go along to get along. Uh, we weren't going to give a pass or barter. Uh, concessions, you know, support, if North Korea supports us on North, excuse me, if China supports us on North Korea, well, we'll be deferential towards China's self-proclaimed uh, core interests. We didn't do that. Thirdly, we work to improve communication at all levels. Leader level, of course, because, hey, China is an authoritarian country. You've got to be talking to the leaders if you're going to have an impact, but also to expand horizontally to try to widen uh, communications across the spectrum of stovepiped agencies and elements of Chinese government, Chinese society, uh, to cover the range of issues encompassed in the U.S.-China relationship, and vertically in the sense of not just at leader level, but uh, down through the working level where implementation has to take place. And also along what, call it the Z-axis, uh, the people-to-people, -people, the institutional, the academic, uh, the, the connectivity uh, between businesses through exchange, et cetera, et cetera. We try to do all that. The last element in my description anyway is what I'd call the, the three R's, resolve, reassurance, and rules. So by resolve, I mean that the United States showed that we would stand firm on issues and values uh, important to us, uh, including on matters like uh, international law, universal freedoms, uh, and that applied in the South China Sea, it applied in the Senkakus, applied in the Taiwan Straits. Reassurance in the form of, as Obama said again and again and again, the U.S. welcomes the peaceful rise of a China that is whole, uh, that is at peace, that's prospering, and we worked to demonstrate that in what we did, not only in, in what we said. And rules in this sense, that there shouldn't be a superpower exemption 
from international law uh, and from universal norms. Notwithstanding all of the failures of the United States in history to fully honor uh, international law or our own uh, obligations, um, the, the conviction uh, that we held and that America holds that no country, neither the U.S. or China, uh, can exempt itself from the rules, that we're bound by the same rules as big, as small countries, notwithstanding that we have the power to flout the rules. And that was a key component of our South China Sea strategy, where uh, our arguments were based on international law, not on merely an opinion about sovereignty. Okay. But that was then, and this is now. And now the Trump administration is showing uh, a mix of cordiality on the one hand and belligerence on the other towards China. President Trump has uh, publicly declared his feelings towards Xi Jinping are incredibly warm, that he celebrates the great chemistry that they have. Um, at the same time, he sees no contradiction, apparently, in turning the trade relationship into battle space, holding up the prospect of sanctions under, our, uh, under Section 301, putting in place punitive tariffs. The papers are talking today about a, uh, a $100 billion spanking. Uh, although in his, he tweeted $1 billion, maybe uh, two decimal points is just sort of doing business in the, in the Trump era, I don't know. Uh, the late and lamented uh, Rex Tillerson, as secretary, vilified Chinese development in Africa when he was just there last week, warned against you know, the dangers of the Belt and Road. And most significantly, much more significantly, the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, the nuclear posture review, three important policy documents issued by the Trump administration in the last four months, all characterized China, and China is always lumped together with Russia, as the preeminent threat faced by the United States, not terrorism, not pandemics, climate change, not anything, China. This is not an abstraction if you are reading this in Zhou Nanhai, if you're a senior Chinese official. These are not just words because the Trump administration has also significantly boosted defense spending because the Trump administration is talking openly and Congress is passing legislation to encourage uh, visits to Taiwan by U.S. warships, all kinds of changes to our relationship with Taiwan and beyond that. You know the old saying, even the paranoid, even, even, even paranoids have enemies? Well, so in, back in 2011, I remember uh, Aaron Friedberg wrote a book in which he um, made the case for the inevitability of U.S.-China strategic conflict. And that theme has uh, be been resurgent uh, now with, say, Graham Allison's book on the uh, imminent threat from the Thucydides trap. I have, throughout all of this time, been arguing as forcefully as I could against that thesis of a kind of inescapable clash for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it seems based on determinism, that there's something you know, inexorable uh, about this dynamic. But my point has always been, and this I felt strongly about working directly for the President of the United States and the National Security Advisor. Leaders are not billiard balls. They don't have to 
uh, move according to these pressures. Uh, they don't have to yield to these kind of mechanistic forces. And averting strategic rivalry, ensuring that uh, we didn't act uh, in ways that were going to drive us towards conflict uh, was a very important uh, component of Obama's approach to China and I happen to believe was a component of Xi Jinping's approach to the United States as well. Secondly, um, this thesis is predicated on the decay of the uh, existing power. And my argument was, hey, China is rising too, but you know what? So is the United States. Look at the shale gas revolution. Look at energy more broadly. Look at IT and innovation and entrepreneurship and these sort of magical digital unicorn enterprises, Airbnb, Google, Uber, you, you, Facebook, you name it. Like, America is not uh, disintegrating, it's, it's thriving. And thirdly, uh, my argument always was, uh, there are strong institutions in the regional and the international scene uh, that serve as hedges against confrontation in innumerable ways. And in fact, taking the example of APEC or the East Asia Summit, in the Asia Pacific region, institutions are, are thriving and are uh, strengthening. That was then. Because if the Trump administration is in fact taking an overtly confrontational approach, designating China, as I mentioned, as the principal threat to US economic and national security, well, maybe I can't rule out that the billiard balls are going to collide. And what if the United States really comes to believe that America's in decline and therefore needs to be somehow made great again? Or even what if the US is just in withdrawal? And also what if global institutions are accorded less value by a US administration that denigrates multilateralism at the same time that China seems to have enhanced its influence as Xi Jinping did in Davos or created competing institutions like the AIIB or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Well, you could argue then that the guardrails against strategic rivalry are starting to look a little flimsy. Now, there are very specific issues in the US-China relationship that can be, that are sources of tension that have the potential to disrupt the relationship and destabilize the region. North Korea, where there's overlap but not complete unity in our respective objectives. Maritime issues, South China Sea, East China Sea, more broadly freedom of navigation, where there's an inherent contradiction between conventional maritime law and China's assertion of indisputable sovereignty over disputed features in international waters. Taiwan and cross-strait relations, that's always played a huge role in US-China relations. Trade, I mentioned today's headlines about a $30 billion parking ticket uh, the Trump administration says it's getting ready to issue against uh, China for tech, forced tech transfer and other um, serious uh, offenses. There's a basket of law enforcement uh, issues, the so-called fox hunt operations where Chinese security officials uh, essentially uh, coerce or even kidnap Chinese citizens from overseas, from the United States or other countries. Uh, or the exit bans that are put on American business people, citizens sometimes, uh, preventing them from leaving China, often at the behest of a, uh, of a business partner. Influence operations, uh, the activities that in parliaments, in local governments, in universities, think tanks, labs, media, et cetera, you name it. Australia is kind of exhibit A uh, for that problem. But beyond 
any of the specific points of contention, uh, we can increasingly see a broader international struggle for, say, geostrategic or geoeconomic primacy. And uh, a case study in that is the One Belt, One Road, or the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. It's always struck me that uh, the Belt and Road project uh, or initiative is a kind of a Rorschach test. Uh, different people see very, very different things in it. It's different perspectives, depending on change metaphors, sort of what part of the elephant you're touching. So is it a ambitious 21st century Silk Road that unites the Eurasian continent in a network of trade and energy routes, setting the stage for global prosperity? Is it a heavy-handed strategic play to establish military outposts and essentially rec recreate a kind of Han Dynasty imperial system of tributary states around China's periphery? Is BRI a neo-colonial form of spheres of influence via state capitalism? Or is it the flagship of a new globalism? Target countries are wary of exploitation of unsustainable debt loads, of influx of Chinese workers, some of whom will never go home. But who's not up for a little free money? Uh, so you've got these contradictions. You've got differing views even within China. Uh, today, you're not going to hear a lot of Chinese disparage the question, the party line. Uh, but it is not unusual, it was not unusual, certainly privately, to hear many business people, even officials, scholars, uh, speak dismissively of BRI projects as sort of a vanity play. Uh, risky, wasteful, investments that endanger Chinese lives uh, and capital that generate financial mismanagement through expanding government subsidies to SOEs. And there's also the debate about what's behind BRI. You know, one driver is to export excess capacity, steel concrete labor, construction equipment, foreign currency reviews. Another driver is energy security, commercial interests. Fe feeding China's factories and getting its products to market, developing China's rural west and beyond. Uh, military advantage. It's certainly true that the acquisition of ports expand the capacity of the PLA Navy to operate a blue water navy. Uh, it's certainly true the Maritime Silk Road provides access to the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf. There's not anything intrinsically diabolical about that. Any country would want to defend its maritime commercial and supply routes. So the real issue, in my view, comes down to, to trust. And the lack of strategic trust serves to handicap China's ambitions through Belt and Road, and particularly uh, in East Asia. Because there's no question about the need for infrastructure investment in East Asia. There is a question, however, as to whether the investment and the commercial projects aim to simply become a source of leverage, of economic strong arming. Is Belt and Road about connectivity and commerce? Or is it about co-option and coercion? The question relates to a bigger one, which is, to what extent is China prepared to shoulder international burdens, to show restraint and to accept limits, to adhere to standards in order to win trust and to allay some of these fears? Xi Jinping has set incredibly high expectations, uh, expectations for China's future, for national rejuvenication, rejuvenication, both at home and abroad. And to meet these expectations, surely the Communist Party is going to have to win the trust and the confidence, not only of its citizens, but of its foreign partners. Now, of course, a relevant consideration is the extent to which America is sending signals of 
detachment, of disengagement. Because if China's the only game in town, then that's the game that countries are gonna play. But to me, the most profound and the most unanswered question is this. What is it that China stands for that non-Chinese will believe in and will support? Development, great. Trade, great. Infrastructure, great. Laissez-faire politics, maybe great. But none of those are principles that non-Chinese will feel are worth fighting for. So ultimately, we may, uh, we don't know how the intersection of the Chinese dream, the China dream, and the American dream is going to play out on the international stage. But after my own three decades working on foreign policy, my conviction is that the United States and China are simply going to have to find ways to work together to surmount and to reduce our mutual suspicion, to identify a shared interest in building global governance systems, and building systems that both accommodate China's legitimate interests, but at the same time preserve the foundations of a rules-based order that is respectful of universal rights and universal freedom. So where I come out is the US shouldn't walk away from its global leadership responsibilities. And China should seek to endure that it, ensure that its international initiatives complement and not undercut existing international institutions. So that's my thought. Let me stop here and open the floor to your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that overall assessment. I'm Bob Axelrod at the Ford School and uh, Political Science. Um, I grant you the strengths that America has uh, that you outline. Closer. I grant you the strengths that America has uh, as you outline. Uh, but I, my question is, are the terms of uh, competition um, uh, changing uh, in the last decade and probably the next decade in China's favor, and I've mentioned three examples. In the South China Sea, it's clear that they're asserting themselves more than ever. Um, in foreign direct investment, uh, they are asserting uh, control over technology and the terms of investment of American businesses in China. And in terms of foreign influence, as you say, they're expanding their, their influence um, in countries where they invest. And so aren't the terms of the competition uh, moving in China's favor? I think those are three very different uh, instances. Uh, the short answer is we don't know. Uh, in the case of the South China Sea, the, uh, the major uh, drivers of advantage to China have been extraneous uh, events. The election of uh, Rodi Duterte in the Philippines, combined with the uh, coincidence that the Philippines took the chairmanship of ASEAN in 2017, uh, combined with the results of the U.S. presidential election and uh, an administration that uh, either chose or was only able to focus on uh, two issues pertaining to the Asia uh, Pacific region, North Korea and the merchandise uh, trade deficit. And as a result, uh, the dynamic in the South China Sea altered uh, dramatically and rapidly. Uh, prior to that point, uh, you'll recall, in the aftermath of the judgment handed down by the Law of the Sea Tribunal, uh, China was 
uh, back-footed and was uh, in retreat from earlier absolute assertions about sovereignty over the nine-dash line, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we, it was, we and the claimant states and uh, most of the ASEAN countries certainly, and interested countries, certainly had their hands full uh, trying to shape China's behavior in the South China Sea. But uh, I think things were definitely not going the way the Chinese had envisaged them. Th that's different now. In terms of foreign direct investment uh, into China, uh, the Chinese are s uh, perhaps killing the goose that uh, lays the golden eggs. It is certainly true that uh, chi the Chinese regulations, Chinese practices, and the prejudicial uh, treatment, the leverage that the huge China Chinese market uh, offers, uh, have combined to uh, compel the transfer of a lot of intellectual property and a lot of technology uh, to China. And I think people who uh, paint a caricature of China merely as uh, the, the, the bandit, the robber, uh, the thief, incapable of developing its own uh, intellectual property or competing technologies are making a very big mistake. But the fact is that it, China has been operating in a way that is inherently unfair, uh, and I'd argue unsustainable, even though they can get individual companies for a period of time to hold their nose, hold their breath, and to uh, make sort of deals with the devil when it comes to localization of data and sharing of technology and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's a, an equation that we haven't uh, seen the end of yet. Uh, I think, though, that there are uh, abundant indicators from the international business community as well as from international uh, legislatures and governments that enough is enough, and uh, that inevitably uh, the cost to China for this kind of predatory and prejudicial uh, behavior will, s will start to rise. In terms of uh, foreign influence, China's influence uh, overseas, well, I, you know, I tried to make the case that the, uh, the variables there are the behavior of China itself as well as uh, the behavior of the United States. Uh, if the United States and the network of uh, Western liberal uh, free market democracies uh, flourish and remain as uh, remain available as advocates, if not guarantors, for an open system, for a rules-based system, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, then my experience is, and admittedly I'm not unbiased, but my experience is that uh, that is pref pref the preferred partner, that these are the partners of choice for most societies, not all governments. Some of the strongmen in Asia are only too happy to deal uh, with the Chinese because they can trade national interests for personal gain. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, countries in Asia, in my experience, while they do not want to have to make a choice between China or the United States, they do want to have choices, and they want to have the ability to make their own choices. And even if they don't chronically choose to align themselves with the United States or do what the US says, 
a credible U.S. presence, engagement, involvement, and the expectation that the United States is going to speak out, speak up, and maybe act in the event that rights and borders and international law are fundamentally compromised, uh, I think gives them the latitude to make their own choices. So uh, not a succinct answer, but that's what I've got. Hi there, thank you so much for talking to us today. My name is Amara, I'm a first year MPP student. And my question to you was, how do modern diverse religious practices within Chinese society uh, impact both domestic and foreign policy? And how do, how do those practices relate to this idea of Chinese morality when they communicate with other nations? Well, speaking from my own experience, um, the uh, efforts by Obama, Hillary Clinton, Vice President Biden, John Kerry, other senior U.S. officials, uh, congressional delegations, uh, distinguished Americans, and people like me in our engagements and encounters with, uh, with Chinese leaders and Chinese officials to make the practical and uh, pragmatic case for religious tolerance, for the respect, uh, for respecting uh, different creeds and faiths within China, uh, was like talking to a brick wall. <laughs> and my, my Chinese partner, counterparts at least, were Number one, uh, brilliant debaters who availed themselves of the artesian well of American hypocrisy. <laughs> Whether they were reaching back into the late uh, 19th century or they were you know, going to uh, you know, Charleston or uh, another modern episode in the United States, uh, they could paint a picture of a, of a vicious, corrupt, intolerant, racist, uh, religiously intolerant uh, America that makes your blood run cold. Uh, moreover, uh, I found them categorically resistant uh, to very uh, pra practical fact-based arguments uh, about the effect that their uh, policies in Xinjiang have uh, among the Uyghur communities and of the, the trouble uh, that they are cultivating. Uh, the, uh, the Petri dish uh, that, that they're making, uh, which is just so ripe for the introduction of uh, extremist doctrine and the uh, ISIS-type jihadist message. And we went to great pains to share information with the Chinese that would help them see what the return of foreign fighters from Syria looked like and where and what we knew was happening in uh, further west in Central Asia, et cetera. Um, but I've never been part of a, of a discussion or a process with the Chinese uh, in this area that in which they didn't devolve almost exclusively to the, like, give us names and, uh, you know, we, we want you to outlaw all Uyghur-related, Uyghur-sympathetic groups, and so uh, we, just, we just could not get through to them. Um, you have the issue of, the, of home churches, uh, as well as the tug of war underway now over, with the Vatican over the authority to name priests and so on and so forth. Uh, so every experience that I've had as a diplomat in dealing with religious related issues uh, and ethnic minority issues in China uh, has taken me to a dead end. 
in terms of how other countries uh, behave, um, I've, I, I'm not, I haven't seen much evidence uh, that uh, countries like Indonesia uh, or Malaysia, uh, Muslim majority, uh, develop well developing and emerging uh, uh, economies and societies in East Asia uh, have allowed their concerns about the treatment of uh, Muslims within China to interfere with business. Um, so I just can't report that I've seen evidence there. So I'll limit myself to that. Yeah. So I got the microphone from somebody, um, but I'll, I can pass it down after. I just have one. Um, uh, it's a pretty simple question. It's it's what do you what do you think is the best outcome of a meeting between Trump and Kim Jong Un? And I just want to preface it by what I was surprised to see in the media reaction as a kind of victory. Because it seemed to me to be such, even Dennis Wilder, I think, talking up Fox News about this is something that only a Republican administration can do and making a comparison to Nixon going to China. Because it seems to me that this is a, it's just another part of the failure of American foreign policy regarding North Korea. We are now saying that we will meet and bilaterally with North Korea, which is something that the other administrations prior to Trump said they would not do. And um, they are much, much closer to having um, nuclear weapons or have nuclear weapons that can hit the US mainland. So um, the basic question is, what could be the best outcome? Sure. Not well, Trump, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't mean the Trump Tower Hotel in Pyongyang. <laughs> um, look. Uh, this is, there are plenty of people who are, as the saying goes, putting, pig, putting lipstick on, on a pig. But um, this is not Nixon going to China. And you can ask Henry Kissinger. <laughs> you can ask <laughs> Wynne Lord. You can ask Dave Roy. This is not that. That was a, a thoroughly considered, meticulously planned, deliberate, strategic move. More to the point. It was an American move. What's happening now is a North Korean move. This is the North Koreans, whatever they may have actually said to the South Koreans, setting up uh, an outcome that they've aspired to for now uh, three generations, demonstrating that the American president, the world superpower, will come and deal with the leader of North Korea as a peer. And doing it moreover uh, at a moment when North Korea is in complete defiance of international law and has rebuked and frustrated uh, the United States and all its uh, partners, uh, thereby in effect legitimizing North Korean nuclear and ballistic missile programs. Establishing, okay, you may not like it, but you gotta deal with me, and you gotta deal with me as I am, as a nuclear power. And that is the Kim family agenda, not the Trump family agenda, not the US agenda. So it's not Nixon to China. You could argue that the closest analogy is Jimmy Carter to Pyongyang in 1994. All right, he was no longer a sitting US president, but he went in a missionary spirit of conviction that he, if you sat down face to face with the North Korean leader, you could reason with him, you could make a deal, you could silence the drums of war that are beating in Washington, and you could get a pause, and you could save his face. That was what Jimmy Carter set out to do. And to a certain extent, you could say, all right, well, he opened an alternative path. Both sides hit the pause button, and negotiations, uh, in fact, did ensue. 
the uh, using that as the model, the probably the best thing that one could hope for in a Kim Trump summit is that it doesn't go badly, that it uh, results in both sides agreeing to pause any escalatory moves and to open the door to some kind of negotiation. But the fundamental problems in the, uh, in the equation are utterly unchanged and unaffected. Or to the extent that they are affected, it is not to our advantage because the, uh, number one, North Korea's status and stature, which is not trivial, is radically enhanced. Um, the leader domestically, but also North Korea more broadly. Related to that, number two, and very importantly, is um, sustaining and, and in, intensifying international sanctions against anybody, in this case, North Korea, is you know, a bailing the boat exercise. It takes constant, constant work. You've got to maintain a lot of positive pressure just to keep the business as usual deal makers from reverting to making money, which is kind of what this uh, sanctions busting and black market is really all about. And not every country is nearly as motivated as the United States or Japan to implement sanctions. Once you see the picture of Kim and Trump shaking hands, sitting down at a table, and the headlines are, you know, sigh of relief, um, spring has come, olive branches and doves, uh, Bambi and Thumper. <laughs> the level of sanctions enforcement is going to drop precipitately. And so there's a second dimension in which North Korea has already w moved far along uh, towards its goals. Thirdly, North Korea's MO is divide, create gaps, split. Uh, it operates in the gaps among the five major powers around it. And already one could impute uh, gaps between the United States and Japan. What the hell just happened? Between the United States and China. The lingering fear on the Chinese part in the American push for China to crack down on North Korea is that the Chinese said, we're going to alienate North Korea forever while you Americans are going to go in the back door and make some sort of deal and leave us hanging. Well, what's going on? And even South Korea, uh, it's one thing to have inter-Korean talks where so the South is in the lead, but w w where is Ki Moon Jae-in, the head of South Korea, left when it's Donald Trump who's now taken the chair? So there are uh, infinite complications and risks associated with this move. Uh, does not make it more advantageous in getting at the uh, negotiating objectives that we have on the nuclear issue. But the biggest risk, Mary, is the simple one. If your starting point is the ultimate authority, the highest diplomatic actor that a state can produce, its leader, where do you go from there? What if it doesn't work? And God forbid, what if it goes badly? Uh, so um, I think the notion that there's a hidden genius in what may otherwise be described as a Hail Mary pass uh, is something we should suspend judgment on until our own receiver has caught it and taken it across the finish line. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Philip Lipsy, Stanford University. Um, 
I, I think you rightly focused on U.S.-China relations in the talk, but I'm curious to hear your views on kind of the other countries that are stepping up in the Trump era, Japan with the new TPP, Germany, you have the Japan-EU uh, trade agreement, um, you know, Japan also providing a lot of financing for infrastructure in the region that arguably competes with the Belt and Road Initiative. And so, you know, is, is this a hopeful sign that even if U.S. leadership might experience some turbulence that other countries are willing to step up to the plate and uh, uphold the international order? Or is this simply not enough and too limited? And, and so uh, I'd, I'd be interested to hear opinion on what to think about that. Right. Well, um, one would love to think that there is an option uh, whereby the model of a uh, the primacy of America as a superpower uh, and as the leader of, of various alliances uh, evolved into a more uh, co-equal fraternity or sorority of uh, peaceful, like-minded, free market dem democracies. Um, that would be a good thing. And the United States, I think, historically has accepted and embraced the principle that um, it's willing to take a smaller rel relative share of a bigger pie and that the growth of Japan and Europe, et cetera, isn't a threat, it's an asset, et cetera. The, the TPP example, however, uh, raises some real concern. Because while you may see individual countries or groups of countries stepping up to some degree, you're not going to see uh, an emergence of a, of a substitute for the United States in, if, in fact, the United States is retreating or retrenching. Um, certainly not one that shares the commitments to universal rights and values. In the case of the TPP, um, this began as an emergency effort to keep the patient alive or to sort of cryogenically preserve uh, the trade agreement for the day when America sort of came back to its senses and decided that if that was just a epileptic fit, we're here, we're in, we're back, everything's okay. And I discussed this with a number of, uh, of Australian and Japanese and uh, Vietnamese and other counterparts. And that was really the thinking behind the TPP-11. Like, let's just not let it die. Um, maybe the Americans will change their minds. In the process of sorting out what a TBP without the United States would and wouldn't be, something interesting happened. The 11 countries formed their own trade agreement. Yes, it's cannibalized from the parts that were t the original TPP, but it's now a real thing. It's a thing. And they're pretty happy with it. And not all of them are so utterly convinced that we got to have the Americans back. And the terms on which they would have the Americans come back into TPP are their terms. So what has evolved is not just sort of either as a substitute for the United States or a straight up uh, outgrowth of what the United States champion. They've done their own thing. Uh, and in doing so, they've learned that they had better insulate themselves from the United States. They needed to diversify their economies away to be less dependent on the United States. They learned that the, they couldn't rely on the United States. So that's the cloud that surrounds the silver lining of uh, the TPP uh, 11. Now, 
I think it's right uh, for the Japanese, the Australians, the U.S., and others in looking at the Belt and Road and looking at China's infrastructure projects to th to decide, hey, we are not going to just seed the field. We're not going to disappear. We have a lot to offer uh, the countries in Central Asia, the countries in South Asia, the countries in East Asia, and China is by no means the only game in town. I, I'm all for that. Personally, I think that, uh, that presenting it as a rival or as a, a counter to Belt and Road is two-dimensional thinking. Uh, it's not all that credible. Uh, and it sets it up in the wrong way. I mean, I, I think that if the US, Japan, Australia, India uh, began with an inventory of the attributes of our investment, but, you know, there is important governmental uh, work in terms of development assistance, but the vast majority of money that flows into these regions comes from the United States, and it's private money. It's, it's commercial investments. Our foreign direct investment in East Asia vastly outstrips that of China. And when you, take, when you unpack it, um, yeah, they're trying to make money, but <clears throat> they are bound, for example, by US law that prohibits bribery, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. That's no small matter. They export traditions of corporate social responsibility that having traveled around and seen a lot of these projects and companies are really admirable and, and impressive. Uh, and they have other accomplishments and attributes that are tremendously appealing and of value to the target countries, to the host countries, whether it's on environment, whether it's on labor standards, whether it's on debt sustainability, uh, et cetera. I think that those are good grounds to compete, but the goal ought to be convergence because, I mean, what China has in terms of resources, in terms of construction capabilities, et cetera, are, you know, immense. What it doesn't have is a commitment to the standards in these kinds of projects that we consider to be uh, desirable. And so the goal is not to uh, produce head-to-head -head competition, in my view. The goal is to try to shape uh, the direction of and the character of China's own uh, investments and projects. Thank you. That's a great point to finish on. Uh, we uh, appreciate very much uh, your insightful remarks and responses to our questions. I hope you'll all join me in thanking Danny Russell for coming here and visiting us. Thank you. Thank you.